yeah we're definitely so we are live and um it's almost on the hour and when uh when you open things up lara feel free to mention the recording uh, i definitely will we don't, don't want people to be surprised um yeah and well, i'm sure we're gonna have a great show today i'm really looking forward to our first is this an actual room is that what it's called it's a room within the club oh Hi, Sana. Hi. I, I don't know. Oh, there Lara is. Uh, <laughs> I was adding people. So, hi, Chris. Hey, hello. How are you? Good. Um, but yes, this is a room under the club. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. All right. Well, over to you, Laura, and I'm happy to do any tag teaming you like. Wonderful. Well, um, thanks everyone for being with us this afternoon. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Of course, we encourage your questions and we want your input. So um, in order to make this chat inclusive, we just encourage you to say your name, um, ask your question, make your comment. And then of course, we would like to have you close by once again, saying your name and I'm done speaking. Um, and for those of you who have joined us, we are recording this because we do like to um, make sure that we can utilize this fantastic content in multiple forums. And so um, this is being recorded today. So with that, um, let us get started. Um, this morning, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced that the U.S. added 916 jobs in the month of March. Um, and they also felt that the economy is beginning to heal. But as economic development professionals, it's not time for us to take our foot off the gas. Um, and so today we're going to talk about best practices for economic recovery and resilience. And I'm so excited to be joined by Sana Kendall, who is the Senior Manager of Economic Recovery for the City of Fort Collins, Colorado. And we have Chris Harder, and Chris, I'm going to slaughter your company's name, so please correct it. <laughs> the Caraggio bad. Group? No, you, you nailed it. I did. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I feel so good. Um, which is a strategy, leadership, and organizational change management consulting group out of Portland, Oregon. Um, and, of course, we be remiss if we didn't thank our founder of this particular club, Dan Taylor. And Dan, once again, thanks for letting us um, use the Economic Development Club to have this important conversation. How exciting. Thanks, Lara. I mean, I'm really excited about today's discussion. Uh, I never really thought of myself as the founder, but I, I suppose I am. So that's wonderful. And then what, what I think is great is we've created this, uh, you know, uh, ECDEV network platform for uh, people within the profession and affected by the profession to organize their own discussions like you've done today, uh, because I'm sure there are, are are more stories than we could count on our on our fingers and, and toes. So I'm looking forward to um, everything that you folks have to uh, have to say today. Great. Well, let's get started. And I'm going to throw a question out to our group. Um, this pandemic has given rise to a K-shaped recovery with those on the upper leg of the K thriving and those on the lower leg continuing to struggle or even you know, becoming more economically um, impoverished. So with this, um, the American Rescue Plan, of course, is rolling out. And I'm curious what strategies should economic developers be looking at to support those on the lower leg of the K-shaped recovery with ARP dollars or if you're not in the US, what are some tactics that may be helpful um, to our followers? Chris, Sana, I'll, I'll leave it open to whoever would like to respond. Sure, I can, I can jump in and start here. Um, you know, this, this idea of a K-shaped recovery, I've been wrestling with it um, in my job right now. And I spent many years in, in economic development in the field and now in consulting work with communities and businesses. So we've been wrestling with this idea of, you know, what is the recovery looking like? And I think there's pretty strong consensus around this K-shaped recovery. But what I've been wrestling with is, it feels like we've always been in the K-shaped economy. So 
um, even when the macro indicators, you know, however we want to look at those GDP, employment, et cetera, um, are really strong growth. We've always had elements of our communities. Um, it can be our BIPOC um, uh, uh, folks. Uh, it could be our rural communities um, who in many cases aren't, you know, um, uh, experiencing the same economic opportunities and outcomes um, as others are. And sometimes that gets lost in these kind of macro, macro data points. So I guess what I would kind of say about this is what this situation we've been dealing with the last year uh, related to COVID and its economic impacts um, is it's really just brought to life probably many of the systemic challenges we've been dealing with in economic development and in our own communities um, for many, many years. So as it relates to what do we do now and how do we use these resources coming from, from the federal uh, government or other sources is to me, it, it is really kind of thinking critically around where in our economy needs help. Um, I'm a big believer in, or I should say the, the opposite way. I'm not a big believer in the concept of rising tide lift all boats, um, in part because we've had very systemic barriers um, for many different types of people out there. So the idea that economic development and the profession would be targeted around communities being left behind, whether that's demographic or geographic, um, solving some of our key infrastructure issues like rural broadband, um, continuing to support you know, how hard it is to start and, and run a small business. Um, I think those things that have been sitting there for many, many years have now, you know, we've been forced to, to really acknowledge them um, is where the money should go. And, and again, I don't think a lot of this is new. I think we've been, um, we've had the luxury of not having to focus on it um, for a decade or so or much longer. Yeah, I would agree with um, Chris on we it's not like um, inequities began because of the pandemic. They were already here. Um, what the pandemic did, I think, is really shined a light on the challenges that um, many of our community members have found. And um, as Chris mentioned, I think even this idea of the macro da data and how do we actually really disaggregate it and really look at how it's impacting our whole community instead of the average community is a really important piece of it. I think about the um, CARES dollars that we all received as community members, right? Um, and, you know, my role at the city was how do we allocate that to those that needed it the most? Um, my colleague Shannon Hein is on the call today too. And we, we actually did um, business grants. We have about 6,000, almost 7,000 uh, small businesses in Fort Collins, Colorado. We gave out uh, about 200 grants. And to me, that was really because of access and awareness. There's a lot in our community that struggled with how to access resources, how to make sure that they were ready to receive the requirements that we as local government tend to put on um, these, I, this idea of free money and grants to help support our small businesses and our community members. And I think um, that's one we're grappling with now in preparation of the American Rescue Plan dollars. Um, and again, I think one of the biggest pieces is how do we disaggregate the data and really tell the story of what's happening in our community um, for those that live it daily. Um, whether that is from our BIPOC business owners or our women veteran owned business owners, right? Um, how do we really look at that at a disaggregate level? When we looked at unemployment in December um, and to hear that um, all the job loss was actually female, is pretty disheartening, right? And um, there, there was some job gains. And so we really kind of look at those aspects as well as how do we really dive in and see what is that true impact in the community that we're all trying to help uh, serve. That's great. And uh, just to reset the room, um, you are uh, in the economic development club 
and we appreciate you joining our room. We're talking best practices for economic recovery and resilience today. And we have Sana from Fort Collins, Colorado, Chris from the Caraggio Group in Portland, Oregon, and Dan Taylor from Ont- Innisfil, Ontario, Canada. Dan, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring a bit of a, a Canadian perspective, and I, I really f- feel, um, you know, following the U.S. to a certain degree, it, I, I think it's a little difficult for us to grasp and understand exactly what's happening in the U.S. versus Canada, and, and even across the regions. I know that um, our government has really uh, come to the table with a variety of relief programs. Something called CERB is a $2,000 a month payment for those losing their jobs and being affected um, by uh, lockdowns, etc. Um, there are I don't want to say universal, but somewhat universal grants where I don't think it's a 200 to 6,000 ratio, uh, but it's, it's, it's more um, equitable. I don't think it's perfect by any means. I know there's been some real challenges in um, uh, tenant, uh, tenant landlord issues and in trying to circle that square. There was a well-intended program that I don't think went very well at the beginning. I, I've lost track a little bit. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't want to say for the most part, because I don't want to diminish the impact and the difficulties, but uh, I think the Canadian government has done fairly well. Um, I wouldn't mind uh, not switching a bit, talking about uh, an experience I had in difficult times. And I'm not quite sure how to equate it I can equate it to this discussion, but I'm not quite sure how to equate it to um, the, the effects of the pandemic as very different circumstances. And, and it, in, a, in a way, it's not disaggregated. But I'm going to put it out there and either that'll be something we're talking about or you can all nod your head and go, thanks for sharing, Dan. Um, so I, um, I uh, was, a, was the economic development officer in a, a small rural and tourism area called Prince Edward County for about a decade. When I got there, um, it was in a a 50 year depression. Um, It was the second poorest county in all of Ontario. And we started building a brand um, and an economy that was um, more focused and more defined in leveraging its strengths. And uh, in that decade, we hit uh, 9-11, we hit uh, SARS, we hit the 2008 financial crisis, and there may have been one or two other challenges in between. And And data wasn't the greatest, but I, I can tell you anecdotally, and I'm pretty sure from a reality perspective, our economy kept growing. Very different circumstances, so I'm not quite sure how to how to compare the two. And I, and I, I, I think I have a bit of a point. <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent sure it is, <laughs> but I think my point is, you know, if you can really have um, a focus and unite businesses together, uh, that may be a form of resiliency. I, I, I'm acknowledging that I am talking apples and oranges, but I just wanted to share that. Uh, and maybe, Maybe what I'm really painting a picture of is, you know, the way out, if you will. So why don't I stop there? I'd be happy to answer questions or, or, or be discounted that it's apples and oranges and it, it doesn't uh, equate. No, and I think it does because I think anytime there's an economic downturn, as economic development professionals, we're always seeking ways to um, overcome the economic impacts of those downturns, whether it's a global pandemic that made this happen, or if it was, um, you know, a, a hurricane or an earthquake or whatever, you know, was sort of the the causation of the economic impact. And so, you know, I think one thing I, I would love to hear from uh, the panel is tell me, you know, how are you measuring the recovery? Like, how will your communities know that you've entered into recovery? 
Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on what measurements you're using, what metrics are you using? And um, for those who have just joined our room, you are joining the Economic Development Club where we're talking about economic recovery and resilience. If you're enjoying this conversation, please hit the little plus button and ping people into our conversation. Um, and of course, as always, if you have questions, press the little hand button. I would love to bring you up on stage or if you have a comment. Um, but again, I would just encourage you to make this conversation inclusive, which means make sure that you introduce yourself, make your question or comment, and then end it by saying you're done speaking with your name. Um, with that, let's talk about metrics. Um, Sana, Dan, Chris, how are you measuring whether or not you're making an impact on the economy? This is Chris uh, with Caraggio Group. Um, oh, this is always a good question. Um, but in part, partly in answering, I want to reflect on something, uh, Laura, both you and Dan mentioned is, and Dan was, was talking about, you know, is some of the previous downturn, does it feel a little bit apples to oranges in terms of how we address kind of what we're currently going through now? Um, I think the one thing that we can take away from any time we're going through a quote unquote crisis is um, it's always an opportunity um, to learn. And I think it, it, it to what some of the previous comments have said, it really does highlight areas of our communities and economies that we really need to focus on. So if we look at situations like we've been dealing with the last year, year and a half, um, the glass half full is, I don't think any of us um, would want what we're dealing with around it. Um, but if we look at it glass half full, um, this really does give the field of economic development an opportunity to kind of hone in on what matters um, and to, in many cases, kind of shift what it means to do economic development. So I'll just kind of throw that out there in a bit of a response to what um, Dan was talking about. Um, metrics, um, uh, you know, Again, this is this is kind of you'll you'll hear some of my personal biases here. Of course, you you monitor kind of the 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 larger macro data. Um, you know things like unemployment rates, consumer spending, consumer confidence um, measures, those types of things, which are traditionally at the national kind of or state level. Um, and in some cases, I'm not necessarily a data expert here, but. Um, some some cases you can get those at the local level, um, but I think what the challenge of monitoring data like that um, uh, is it, it it doesn't really give the nuance of what's happening in a community, um, and so you got to be careful with that. And again, kind of the point brought up front, you know, created ninety four thousand jo jobs or whatever in the last month. Um, uh, it all depends on who's getting those jobs and where those are those jobs are occurring, and, and there's just a ton of nuance there. I think at the local level, which is where a lot of us are spending our time, um, uh, the challenge is always, you know, data isn't as good as um, it is at the state or federal level. So what do you do about that? And I think it does become a little bit more anecdotal. Um, I think it relies on kind of the relationships you have and an understanding of how certain industries and businesses are performing. Um, and so I think those conversation pieces and really kind of connecting with the network tell a lot about kind of where things are headed, um, particularly in a quote unquote leading indicator way. So um, uh, there is this general feel out there that you can gather from talking to businesses, business leaders, industry leaders about our things are improving uh, or not. And, and th those may be just as simple as we're, we're seeing an uptick in people um, uh, eating at our food and beverage uh, restaurants or um, retail spending, or, um, you know, you can get some data around accommodations uh, are going up at, at, uh, in hotels or um, uh, foreign delegations are starting to return and look at foreign direct investment opportunities. Um, those types of things. Uh, so uh, in times like this where the data, either you can't get it or it's a lag, I do think just that relationship conversation piece probably gives us the best sense of, are we headed in the right direction in our economy um, or where do we still need to focus? So 
and this is Chris, and I'm kind of done with that. Thanks, Chris. Dan, looks like you've got your mic off. Yeah, th thanks. So there's an old, uh, I want to build on what Chris was saying. So I totally agree about the, the macro data uh, at the state or federal or provincial level. Um, and, and it's also um, averages, right? Unfortunately, averages don't really give you great information. It's a bit whitewashed. Um, the great thing about uh, working in a smaller communities, uh, which I, I have been in, is you can actually get closer to the community. And while the data or the information may very well be anecdotal, um, I, I think uh, one can compile that anecdotal data into fairly accurate picture painting. So um, there, there's nothing like trying to get on the ground. It, certainly it gets more difficult when you get into, you know, medium and, and larger size centers. Um, the other thing that uh, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more as we're talking about recovery and resiliency is I really, you know, believe uh, that um, the world has accelerated by, you know, a decade or so. Technology, use, remote work, etc. I was a little concerned at the beginning of the pandemic about what does economic development mean when um, we're all almost all geocentric. Forget the actual political lines, but just the geography of, of the place and in a remote world. Uh, however, I'm getting the feeling that um, quality of place uh, and uh, lifestyle and the quality of your community probably may mean more now than ever before. So I'm bullish on that. And I'm really bullish on human resiliency, human creativity, and human innovation. I think both in the economy and in the profession and in community building, uh, as community builders, as most of us are here, that I think we're really we're really going to rise to the occasion, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And I'm done speaking. Thank you. Sana, did you have anything to add on metrics? Um, yeah, I would just reiterate with both uh, Dan and Chris, we're sharing in terms of it is both the qualitative and quantitative. Um, an example is one where we were on a call with some businesses this past Monday, um, restaurants specifically, and they had mentioned that they are doing pre-pandemic revenue. Sounds great when you think, oh, wow, that's amazing with capacity at 50% or um, depending on the, the restaurant and the level they're at, um, right, on the size of their um square footage. It sounds great. But then when we dive into that conversation a bit more hearing, they're really concerned, can they keep up when the state fully opens because of the amount of people they'll need to hire and bring on? And will they be able to meet customer expectations with that? So again, that's just an example of where you really need to be able to look at the qualitative and quantitative data that's there right in your community um, in those conversations. I kind of chuckled as Chris was talking about those standard um, kind of economic development metrics, whether it's home prices, uh, consumer confidence, consumer spending and um, sales tax numbers and, you know, heads and uh, what do they call it? Head in bed for tourism, because those are things we're tracking. Right. But those yeah. are also um, data that is in the past. And so it's really hard to say what's happening at this moment, unless we're out in our communities, really understanding it from the people who are living it daily. Um, so that's what I would say. And I'm done speaking. And I would, I would just add, I think what we're circling around is data is really hard, particularly when you're trying to predict where are things going. So I think where most of us tend to land is let's look at as much as we can. And from that, you know, see where that, what the story is telling us. And some of that are those kind of more macro indicators, imperfect as they are. Some of those are just the kind of anecdotal information that we're gathering from having conversations, meeting with communities, working with businesses and stuff like that. So um, I wish there was an easy answer to all that kind of stuff, but it just means um, a commitment to taking in as much information as you can and, and trying to make sense of it. No, you're absolutely right, Chris. And, 
you know, what I've been seeing is a number of economic development organizations tearing up their metrics and really starting from scratch, um, especially around economic mobility and looking at how we can support the entire community. So I, I think that there's some really great examples um, of those metrics. And Atlanta has just completely scrapped theirs, have come up with a whole new set under one Atlanta plan. Um, and there's several other communities that have really changed the metric. And I think that's really exciting. But um, I've it welcomed Emily up to the stage because I wanted to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and the startup ecosystem, primarily because I see my friend Alicia Moran in the audience. Um, and I know she would love to hear from you all on what are some things your community is doing to support entrepreneurs? And I leave that open to all of you. Um, I, I notice Emily's not coming on yet. So a, a couple of things in, in our community, uh, after a bit a bit of uh, work, uh, like uh, research, we determined that the opportunity for the town of Innisfil, an hour outside of Toronto, the the fastest growing startup uh, center in North America right now, and, and us being an hour or so away, felt that we were going to start uh, create a startup ecosystem from scratch. There's an organization, a university called Ryerson. Uh, in Toronto, and they have a program called DMZ. It's the number one university accelerator uh, in the world, um, ranked second year in a row. And we ended up partnering with them uh, just as COVID kicked in. We opened up an accelerator space and COVID kicked in. Um, the good news was because we're uh, uh, an hour plus from Toronto, we launched it with the intent of delivering the um, acceleration services virtually. So our program wasn't really diminished. Long story short, we've put roots into our county, which is about a half a million people. We're 37,000 of that half million. There is a bit of a startup ecosystem there with a college, with the angel capital, with some uh, um, um, mentors and, and coaches. And um, we have used that brand, which is very well recognized both globally and in in our region, and have got 19 startups in our system right now. We have the capacity for 25 at any one time. Uh, a few of them have raised uh, about, about 1.5 million to date. We have a couple more that we think will raise another 2 million over the next two years. So we believe the future, and these are, we're industry agnostic because of the size of our community and the lack of s definable sectors, but we're stage specific. So we're looking at startups post idea stage that are in the 12 to 18 month range. They might be pre-revenue and in the 18 to 36 month range where they're actually just pre-seed and getting ready to raise capital. So no mean feat, but we're actually working on and developing an ecosystem and being part of the greater, you know, Ontario slash Toronto ecosystem. Um, the other thing I just want to talk on metrics a little bit, and I can't speak too intelligently about this. Asif is someone who's been on our talks before, and he has a startup um, uh, that uh, is in the data collection business from cellular service. So it's big brother, but it's anonymous data. So it's amalgamated, not down to the individual, your phone, my phone data. I have a feeling information like that, which tracks real time movement, shows when people go to X facility, uh, they also go to Y facility, that it's going to allow us to understand real time movements better, and what to do with those. So those are that was a bit of a mouthful. Uh, I'm done speaking for now. Thank you. Great, Sana, I think I saw your mic come off and then Emily, I'm coming over to you. And I also welcomed Lorenzo and Shannon to the stage. Lorenzo, I wanna come back and talk Main Street development and working with restaurants. And Shannon, I know Sana had mentioned you and some of the great work that you're doing with her in Fort Collins. So uh, I'll be coming to you shortly, but Sana, let's go to you and then to Emily. Um, yeah, no, actually what I wanted to do was um, 
ask Shannon to speak a little bit. You know, we've been really focused on entrepreneurship in um, Fort Collins because we know that in order to really help um, close that or um, minimize that wealth divide, it is really about home ownership and business ownership. And uh, Shannon's brought on a, a couple of staff folks uh, within her team specific in helping those in the BIPOC uh, community really in that space. So I'll be done speaking so that Shannon can talk just quickly about that entrepreneurship world and um, her, what they're really attacking there. Perfect. Shannon. Yeah, hi there. Um, I would just add, we piloted a cultural broker program last summer to help do outreach to our entrepreneurs that they were getting the same information as every other um, business owner. So really targeting our Spanish speaking business owners um, and those that are historically underserved. And it, we had a great response. We were able to connect with um, business owners that we never had before. And that led us to be able to bring on with some CARES dollars, uh, a temporary employee. His name is Jose Luis. Uh, he's a former business owner. And so it just really worked out perfectly. And now he's been able to join our team um, permanently, but he already has these relationships. Um, you know, he's invited to WhatsApp groups. He's created a Spanish speaking newsletter for um, our businesses. And so Asana was talking about uh, the, kind of that boots on the ground and having that those local relationships um, has been so instrumental to to help direct our work um, and and give us some of that insight that that we never would have had before and feedback into what kind of programs we're going to offer with the new stimulus uh, dollars as well and we knew we had this communication gap prior to COVID and Asana said this just helped widen that but we're making strides to to help close that so every business, our, our goal is really that every business is privy to the same information and has the same access. Oh, that's oh and I'm done, so sorry. Important. <laughs> oh, that, that's quite all right. Uh, and that is so important is making sure everyone has access. Um, Emily, do you want to weigh in on conversation around how to support entrepreneurs in your community? Yeah, thank you, Laura, for the invitation. I apologize for any background noise. I had to walk my dog really quick. Um, so I'm located in the Galena, Illinois area, which is the second largest tourism destination in the state of Illinois. And we have quite a thriving small business community. And this year, we've been a couple of things. We've been working with our small business development center to refer a bunch of clients down there so that we can get started. Um, our chamber is partnering with the Rural Ideas Network for a virtual incubator this year that was completely donated by one of our credit unions. And then finally, my organization launched an investment fund for businesses who are looking to expand and scale thanks to a generous donor who had been in Galena back in the 1950s. His heir had finally passed away and we're able to get out grants of about four to $8,000 for businesses this year, which is really exciting. We have three of those. That's really cool. Um, what was the total amount of the fund? We were given about $460,000. And so following the 4% rule, we're giving out a total of 18,000 this year. What types of businesses receive those funds? We are leaving it open by industry. We have a large tourism and small manufacturing. So we're expecting a lot to go to that. However, by virtue of the trust, we're also Oh, I think we may have lost Emily. I hope her dogs didn't pull her down the street. Of an existing uh, business. You're back. Yay. Yeah, we're <laughs> doing it by category, not by industry, just because we want to keep it as open as possible. This year, we're doing one award for the purchase of an existing business to save the legacy businesses that we're losing due to retirement. We're also doing another award for capital and then one for a pilot project. And we'll see what we get. This is the first year, so learning experience for all of us. Absolutely. I think that's true with economic development as a whole. I think we're all learning a little bit on the fly, aren't we? Um, I see that we have a number of audience members. So if you do have questions, please make sure to raise your hand. We'd love to bring you up to the stage and have you ask your question. Um, Lorenzo, I would love to hear from you about 
how you're working with Main Street businesses. And then I'd love to go back to Dan, Sana, and Chris, learn a little bit more about what they're doing to support what I'm going to call the micro businesses, the stores and restaurants in communities. So Lorenzo, what are you doing in your community? So hi, hello. Um, this is my first time as a speaker, so <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so I work for Main Street, which is a non-for-profit that focuses on helping uh, Main Street businesses, and we help them adopt digital tools, technologies, and services. Um, we have several streams of programs, but I'm particularly, uh, I, I work in particular with uh, one pro project called Transformation Teams, and it's uh, like, it's a team of five individual individuals that focus on helping uh, Main Street businesses use the same tactics that they would use in person to like to understand their online uh, audiences and yeah that's like uh, been really successful for us like in the past like maybe seven months we've helped uh, like numerous businesses just like uh, in the Toronto GTA area we helped um, 150 businesses in the last um, six months and this is like engagements of uh, like five weeks so we work with a business for five weeks and, and 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 typically like we just help them understand uh the, the you know digital tools and like something as simple as like how impactful it, how important it is to have like a google my a google my business account so that people can find you easily that's fantastic i love the fact that you're helping companies get uh, a much larger presence than maybe what they could have on their own. Um, if you like what you're hearing from our speakers, if you click their picture, you'll be able to connect with them. Um, we want to make sure that if you liked what you heard and you want to continue the conversation with our speakers, that you have that opportunity to do so. So again, just click the picture. For those of you who may be new to Clubhouse, if you clicking our microphones back and forth. That means that we're applauding the other speakers. Um, so hopefully you'll see a lot of good applause today for the great things that people are saying. Um, with that, let's um, let's talk a little bit more about Main Street. Chris, Sana, and Dan, and Emily, if you'd like to weigh in on this, I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts on what you're doing to support micro businesses in your community. This is Sana. I can um, go ahead and start. Um, have a couple, obviously, of my partners on this call as well. Um, Adam Crow and Shannon have been instrumental in um, this activity. You know, I would say at the beginning of the pandemic, it was really on how do we help them reopen. Um, and now it's really been about how do we help in terms of thriving. And it takes a lot of Thoughtfulness, listening, understanding where where do they want us in local government, um, specifically economic development, um, to help and support. Um, examples would be um, at the beginning, we started a website called fourfortcollins.com that was a social media generator to share with community about whether a business was open or not, right? Um, especially um, around the unknowns of what were capacity, what were restrictions, all of those aspects. Um, I do also think um, what it has done, you know, in our community, we've been focused so much on primary employment or the traded sectors, right? Like the software companies, the manufacturers, and we've left Main Street really to our small business development center. And um, this pandemic has created relationships and authenticity within um, our Main Street businesses and the trust that we haven't had um, since I've been with the city almost nine years now. Um, and I think those are really important pieces. Um, now when they see us come, they don't worry about what are you going to tell us about we're not doing right in terms of compliance it's open conversations and trust that we hadn't seen before um, that allows our public health to collaborate with our main street businesses more um, to get better outcomes for the whole community not just that one business so um, that's been truly insightful um, i think for us 
I was originally tapped in it because my husband and I had owned a restaurant for 30 years. And um, I would have to say this, this has been the most rewarding to see um, the amount of collaboration between restaurants. We no longer see restaurants thinking of each other as competition. They, they have become a community and a support system in themselves. And then um, obviously our retail and Main Street has been, um, re they always had that, but it was the restaurants that I think we're seeing the biggest uh, leaps and bounds with in terms of collaboration. And I love hearing the word collaboration. Um, Chris, what kind of exciting things are you seeing with micro businesses and what examples of collaboration can you share? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say, you know, everything Sana said is kind of what we're seeing here um, in Oregon, at least. Um, and uh, again, in my role, we do work with some communities uh, across the country as well. So we get to see that. Um, I think one of the biggest shifts is if you're if you're coming from a traditional economic development organization, for whatever reason, we always had this divide. We do traded sector, others do kind of main street non-traded sector. And I think what COVID has really brought to light is that needs to be more of an and. Uh, we don't have to divide the economy that way. Um, we can appreciate the impacts that that both have uh, to kind of prosperity and and in the important role they play in jobs and, and all those things. So I'm hoping if this is, you know, again, kind of what can we learn from the situation we're in? It's that we um, value our Main Street small businesses as much as we do our higher growth traded sector small businesses or, or medium-sized businesses. So um, just because we've seen the profound impact that their challenges have had on, on our lives as well. So um, that's one thing. Um, here in Oregon, I, I would say, uh, I mean, all the all the information assistance that that Sana mentioned, you know, I think it's similar here in other communities we're working with. Um, just making sure people are aware what's open, what's not, what are the rules, um, uh, you know, and reminding them that that many of these small businesses and Main Street small businesses or kind of uh, micro enterprises are are open for business. They just may be operating. <laughs> in a different way, just like we're all working in a different way. So communication, um, I would say, has definitely been a, a, been a priority. Um, I guess if I were to pick one other thing, it's that kind of cash is king right now. So um, at least here in Oregon, um, we know about the federal resources, you know, the PPP and, and other things that have come through. And, and I would say on some levels that has been a success. Um, on other levels, I don't think it, uh, it's going to um, as many of the businesses that should be getting it. But, um, uh, you know, the state has been attempting to match here other ways to kind of supplement that. So you are seeing uh, pretty sizable programs. You know, I think in years past, $100 million for a small business grant program with, you know, pretty minimal kind of application criteria that would have been unheard of. And those things are coming through. Um, relatively frequently. Uh, the Oregon legislature just passed a $100 million rent assistance program for small businesses. So if you can demonstrate that you're behind on rent, uh, you can come in and get assistance there. So, and of course that helps land property owners and, and as well. So um, I would say a lot of the focus is, um, you know, part of the challenge is just cash right now to, to, to stay viable is really, really, really important. So um, that has seemed to be a, a pretty strong focus. Um, get, the means for doing that is not the easiest thing in the world, especially at the local level. I think it's probably a little bit easier at the state and national level, though. Great. Would anyone else like to talk about what they're doing to support micro businesses? Laura, I'm wondering if I'm uh, my dad. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Emily. I would. Sorry. Um, so my organization is in a weird position where we were working with micro businesses before the pandemic. One of our most popular programs was a small business like marketing course that we called Build It, Grow It, using the five disciplines of marketing and such. So we just pivoted and we just communicated more about the program that we're doing. We also worked with Joe Davis County, where Galena is located, to administer a, several rounds of the small business stabilization grant, where they basically reimbursed one month worth of rent or mortgage and utilities and we just have been starting to hold more flexible workshops like roundtables 
we haven't pivoted much. In fact, we're starting to spend more time on industrial now than we have since I started this position back in July of 2019. I like that other organizations are taking the more holistic approach because I come from it looking at startups as well as small businesses, but especially in an area where we have a very large tourism economy and a growing tourism economy down in Carroll County, which I also serve, it's really critical to support all of these. Plus, it seems like some of our main street businesses moving into 2021 are the ones most likely to scale. And we're able to grow the garden because we already have these relationships with banks and with our micro enterprises, including one of my clients who just met with a congresswoman last week. So a lot of fun. That's fabulous. Thanks, Emily. Dan? Yeah, I, I, I want to um, riff a little bit on our, our macro discussion, too. So the in Toronto, um, a program was developed called Digital Main Street, which essentially was a program where um, first students and then paid intern and, and young um, tech savvy uh, young folks helped uh, traditional Main Street businesses get their businesses online. The provincial and federal government got together to fund that, and it's now national. So this is a case of, of um, uh, a, a macro program, but being applied at the micro level. So that's wonderful. I think the goal was to get 50,000 businesses online within the year, and I believe they're on track to do that. That's the good news. The bad news is... In our community, we did bring that to the community and we haven't had a lot of success. So I think part of the challenge still is um, mindset. You know, people uh, aren't always comfortable with adopting to change, with adopting uh, with technology, etc. So even when there is help available, sometimes you can't help people. You know, the expression, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So even when we can help, perhaps overcome some issues. Uh, I think there's still some challenges uh, that we need to overcome. Uh, I'm done speaking. Well, and Dan, I think you're absolutely right. You know, as economic development professionals, we always want to support our local businesses, but sometimes they're unaware of the service. Sometimes they think there's a cost, so they don't approach. Um, and so, you know, communicating is really important. So I'd love to hear from the panel, how are you communicating with your business community, um, the different tools and services that you can deploy to assist them? Uh, maybe I'll start. Uh, so Lara, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually had a, a startup that was in the food delivery business. Uh, I'm not sure how much we were all thinking about uh, Uber Eats, etc. Anyway, long story short, they weren't actually doing that great um, for whatever reason. So we sat down and we worked with them and we removed their very nominal $5 charge and we subsidized that for a month and we did um, a paid and an organic social media blitz. And then we slowly uh, halved our contribution and then got out of the subsidy business and their business quadrupled, which involved, you know, a couple of dozen restaurants who also got a boost, etc. And then it only dropped by a quarter. So they ended up staying at 300%. So we've, we've primarily used a lot of social media, paid and organic, and, um, and where we can, uh, obviously, we've had conversations, we're having a conversation right now with a NASCAR Speedway, um, and um, they're having trouble paying their taxes because they can't put bums in seats. I think we heard that expression earlier on today. Um, so certainly one-on-one -on -one where we can and then using social media um, as a means to reach out. And we also have a database. So we do send emails out and look for responses. We also have a customer service desk that receives inbound calls and then they patch those on to the parties that be in this case, you know, economic development issues. I'm done speaking. Great. Sana had asked me to invite Adam up. So Adam, if you see that invite, um, please click it. We'd love to have you join us on the stage. Um, Chris, what are you seeing in terms of communication? Yeah, very similar uh, to what Dan was uh, describing. Um, 
you know, there's obviously the uh, emphasis on social media, getting the word out, um, uh, communicating through more formal channels. I think one of the things I've been pleasantly surprised with is kind of the role of tr traditional media, at least here in, in Portland, you know, uh, what shows up in the Oregonian or the Willamette Week or, you know, the kind of a more, more traditional uh, media platforms um, oft often is covering things like political issues or, or whatnot. And they still are, of course, but you're starting to see them like it, it's not unheard of to see a, a kind of a front page article about um, a new program or new service offerings by small businesses that I don't think a year ago would have ever registered, certainly in the paper or, you know, most of this isn't paper anymore, but online um, and certainly not a kind of a quote unquote above the fold. So I think it just shows you, you know, media is going to respond to what the needs are in the community that they're representing and, and kind of how basic some of these needs are now. So I would just add that I, I've seen that as, you know, kind of media being a partner in all this um, is taking on a, um, a different role in communicating what's out there to help people navigate, um, you know, everything from what's still open or, you know, what are some new ways to get uh, what, you know, common services and et cetera. So um, I've been pleasantly surprised with that. No, you're absolutely right, Chris. And when I was in Salt Lake City, our local news station actually gave me a two minute segment. Um, granted, it was at 6 a.m. every Thursday morning, um, but it was a great opportunity for me to be able to share with the businesses and the community the great work that was happening in economic development, the programs that we had available. And um, it was just a, a really easy way for us to communicate our messaging about you know, economic development and how and the important work that we do. Um, Sana, you wanted to have Adam chime in on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I have the great privilege of working closely with Sana and Shannon as partners. So I'm with um, county government in our community and we work with all the municipalities. And one of the things we did early on in the pandemic, a little over a year ago, was decide that we needed to have coordinated communication among all of our partners. So this includes chambers and economic development organizations, municipalities, um, county government, and a few others, our local university. And those efforts have led to some really great and involved communication with not just our partners, but with our business community, much to what Sean, Sana and Shannon had talked about already. Um, and so, I mean, it goes so far as to each week we're pre-padding um, newsletter content and sending it out to each one of our, our uh, community partners so that they're sending that out to the business community so that there's no confusion and there's the same the same info and we have a, a collective one-stop shop for COVID resources um, that any business in, in our, the northern part of our state, uh, two county region can, can access. Um, and in addition to that, we were able to, because we have all of these partners working in conjunction, build some great partnerships with our local health authority and public health department so that we can work with them in design, uh, designing and getting ahead of very specific messages that need to go out to the community to make sure that they're ready for any changes in guidance or changes in, in um, health orders. And that has been hugely crucial. And as we're moving towards uh, recovery and looking at leaving response behind, um, we know that communication with our businesses right now is super key to make sure that uh, we can maintain case counts and we can maintain safety while people are getting vaccinated and thinking about the future after COVID. So um, that's been very beneficial for us. And um, Laura, I would add, um, what we found is it's not a one size fits all. And so, um, you know, what we found with our Latinx com community is they're utilizing WhatsApp quite a bit. So, um, We've been um, asking our communications department, can, can we utilize that? Can we share information out that way? And I think Chris and Dan also mentioned this, um, the traditional face-to-face -face still matters um, for those that don't, um, are not tied to their phones as much as we as economic development professionals are. So um, I definitely think we've been trying to utilize 
any and all types of um, outreach and communication tools. Um, sad to say, we as city government did not have a business newsletter until the pandemic hit. And now that, um, our organization sees the value in that because what we were finding is that um, our businesses are community members and they need just as much information. And so we really fought for that at the beginning of the pandemic. So for us, it was, it's not a one size fits all. And we've got to um, really look at multimodal communication tools and, and the best way we can. That is such a good point. And I love the fact that you're utilizing tools like WhatsApp as part of your efforts. Emily, and then I'm gonna come over to Dan. Yeah. So what we did is we, I did Facebook lives pretty much every day down to twice a week from like March to June, just talking about different pandemic relief options, reminding people about what's going on and getting word out there. We also did a variety of press releases. We did webinars. We worked with our municipalities and chambers. So every time something came out, I had an email list and it would go blast to every different chamber because we have got like half a dozen, if not more. And we would make sure that people were aware that way. We also had city officials who did a really great job of sharing information. And then this past fall, we actually put up paper flyers in our communities for those who wouldn't see the newspaper press releases and the digital ads, and which we did share in every community Facebook group we could find as well. We've gotten a better response from paper flyers at city halls and gas stations and such and libraries than I would have really expected. So it seems like old school media is also paying off. I love it. The old school flyer. But I also love the fact that you use Facebook Live. That's brilliant. Um, Dan. Yeah, uh, Emily, thanks for sharing. I love that. You, I'm, I'm jealous and envious that we didn't think of that. So good for you. That's great. Um, back to a little bit what Lara was talking about uh, in, in one of the communities I used to work in. We did a monthly uh, newspaper column, um, so same idea, where we would highlight um, a successful business. The whole idea was to build confidence and, and instill hope that other pe people can be successful. Also, in the pre-pandemic stages, we used to hold um, regular um, uh, networking events, you know, and 100 plus people would show up in a very small community. So, so that was, that was great too. And, um, and I love the idea of um, people having their databases using both social media and, and building email databases of key contacts and sending out newsletters. I'm done speaking. Thank you. And I don't know about you all, but I can't wait to go back to a networking event. Um, with that, we're coming up on the top of the hour. So I'm wondering if everyone can give their one piece of best practice for economic recovery and resilience to leave with our audience that maybe they can take home to their communities. Um, and let's start with Sana. Dang it, I was hoping you weren't gonna call me first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sana. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, the one piece of advice would be um, continue to ask questions and um, invite others to the conversation. I think that's the piece. Um, you know, like I said, we started with, oh, we only really focus on primary employment and that is just not sustainable. So um, I would say continue to ask questions and invite people to the table. Dan. Um, go digital and go deep. I believe that um, you know, technology is not technology anymore. It's ubiquitous. I've shared this, I think, with the group in the past. And I think it's our role in economic development to help uh, shape um, resource accessibility on the way of doing business in the future. So I think going digital and going deep can complement any business. The business doesn't really have to change its actual offerings, I don't think. It just has to look at new channels of distribution. The other thing I would add to that is and build build networks social networks and databases so that you can talk to your customers regularly and offer them ways and means to buy your product and services uh, online chris 
Well, going third isn't any easier than going first. I was hoping to come up with something brilliant uh, in the meantime. Um, I, I guess I would just say, you know, I'm a big believer, solve the problems at hand. Don't be constrained by how we've traditionally defined economic development. And, you know, Sana mentioned, you know, this traditional focus of traded sector versus main street and some of those boundaries that for whatever reason we've kind of put on ourselves is solve the problem at hand. And if um, working on rent assistance is what's needed, but that's not traditionally what economic is supposed to quote unquote supposed to do, it doesn't matter. Um, I really do think uh, like a lot of things, it's, this is the time to be innovative, to solve the problems um, to break down those barriers. We'll, we can sort out in years to come what it means for economic development. And, and I do think if we take that approach, uh, the field of economic development and, the, and how we serve our communities will be much better off for that. So I guess if, that, if that's advice at all, that would be my one uh, kind of piece of advice. I love that piece of advice. Emily. Don't be afraid to try something new. Our boards give us a lot more freedom than we think. If you don't know if something will work, try it anyway and just keep adapting like the businesses keep adapting. I love it. Adam. Yeah, I think I'm going to go back to something that Sana had mentioned earlier, and it's through the pandemic, we've all had an opportunity to build deeper and more meaningful relationships with our business community. And uh, anything we can do moving forward to just continue and build sustainability in those actions is, is going to benefit us all and our businesses. Awesome. Well, I love all these recommendations. I know I want to use them in my next community. Um, before we go, though, Dan, do you want to talk about our program next Wednesday at noon? Thanks, Lara. Aren't you, aren't you on it? <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, for those on the call, some of you may not be familiar. Every Wednesday at noon, Eastern Standard Time, actually, we're going to collect people at noon and start at 12.05 and go till 1.05. That's our new thing. Um, we are talking about leadership. And uh, when I'm suggesting leadership, that's leadership within one's role as an economic developer and within the organization you work for, within the community. And what does economic development leadership look like in general? It's going to be a great call, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for the reminder, Lara. Of course. And if you have not subscribed to this room, please follow it. Um, there's a lot more great content coming up. Um, big applause for our fantastic speakers today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the audience, Lorenzo, Alicia, Morgan, Lee, Ryan. It's so love seeing you all here today. And um, thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend.